someone goes back to you. Um, but I'm going to talk today about the use of time. Um, I know we have a lot of conceptual, interesting discussions about what exactly time is, but that difficulty does not seem to stop us from measuring it very well indeed. Um, actually, time is one of the best measured quantity, but it's the best measured quantity of all the quantities that we can use in our universe. Um, and there are some good reasons for that. Um, so I'm going to go through um, a little bit of history about timekeeping through the ages, not too much. Um, but then I'm going to focus on the techniques behind modern timekeeping. And you're probably all visited by atomic clocks. I'll talk about why they're so good um, and the actual day to day business of using one of those to make time measurements. Um, and having done that, um, I'll move on to a few examples. I've had to pick a few, and there are plenty that I've skipped. Um, but clocks, at the level of sensitivity that they reach these days, um, they, they, they kind of cease to be pure timekeeping devices. When you reach a certain level of sensitivity, it's better to think about a device as a sensor for the universe. Um, and from that perspective, it's kind of obvious that you should be able to use a good clock to make a good measurement of the universe as it is. So I'm going to show you three examples of that. Um, but to begin with, a little bit of history. The lunar solar calendar. Uh, and it marks the first recorded point in human history where we began to keep track of the passage of time. Uh, so this, this was used to match the phases of the moon up to these pits that were found in the ground. And it even included a synchronization feature. If you keep track of the phases of the moon, you actually need a leap month every few years. And this mountain range here matches up with the sun when you do that. So it was actually surprisingly sophisticated. And so Time, even 8,000 years BC, was already having a purpose. This is a the kind of this, this was a society of hunter gatherers. This wasn't people who grew plants and were static. And yet, you still need time to understand migrations of animals, to understand the seasons, even then. And it's only and since then, time has even more important than our lives. I'm sure we all know the watch on our hands. But to skip forward quite a long time, there, we go. Um, there was a lot of developments between 8000 BC and 1800 AD. I'll just skip quite a few. But this was another important milestone on the way. Um, this is the H4 marine chronometer, made by man John Hansen in 1759. Um, and it was the solution to a problem. And the problem was. When you sail across an ocean, how do you tell where you are? Well, you can look at the sun and you can look at the moon and you can look at the stars in particular, and they'll give you a good feel of how high on your, you are, your latitude. But if you want to know your longitude, you need to carry a little time reference with you. And that was a really difficult problem. Um, and so the government set out a series of prizes. I think it was 20,000 pounds, which nowadays is billions of pounds. For someone who solved this problem, with a given act. And this is the plot that did it. Nowadays, but that's only about this big, it's a very difficult one to watch, and you probably wouldn't know twice that. But this really was a step change in the ability of time to affect our lives. This is the marked the point where time began to do more than just measure time. It began to navigate us around the world. And anyway, this was GPS, and this was kind of you realize that that's how it went. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot more and move straight to the present now, um, where time is now defined by atoms. Uh, time is the best defined uh, uh, unit of all the units we have in the SI. Uh, it's related to some particular energy level in some particular atoms, and there are good choices for both of those things. Um, so I'm going to go over how that works now, and then at the end of that, I'll tell you how well it works. So, We've had quite a lot of versions so far of how this clock works, so maybe I'll add my own one into the mix and just see how it goes. Um, a lot of people yesterday were talking about the clock as the oscillator, um, which is interesting to me because I usually think about the clock as the reference. So, so to step back for a second, a clock, in my mind at least, takes three parts. There's something that ticks, and there's some way of counting the thing that ticks, 
And there's some way of knowing that the thing that ticks is ticking at the right rate. You need to define the right rate. So in the case of the grandfather clock, like this, the oscillator ticks. You can tune its ticking rate, you can lift it up the mass, up and down. Um, and then you can look every day whether it says noon when the sun is high in the sky. So we're using the Earth as a reference to adjust the oscillator. And then you've got some things that you can the clocks and things that spits out those ticks. Things are measured on them and turns that into a readout that you can use for some time. Um, so when you're making a clock, what you need is a really good ticker and a really good reference. So I'll start with the reference, and um, the most natural reference that you can really think of is an atom. An atom is naturally isolated from its environment. Its properties are set by the laws of physics, and as far as we know, those don't change from time to time, but from place to place. So if you've got some way of taking an atom and finding some natural oscillation in that atom that you can use to refer your clock to, then your game is half one. You've already got some way of sharing time between two different parts of the world. If you take a good atom with a useful transition, you could hope you do quite a good job of that. Um, I'm showing here this wave function here, but you can see it from there, but it's the, uh, uh, the uh, two, two levels in a hydrogen like atom. But this would actually be a fairly poor choice for a clock. It's a practical clock, these sort of traditions to be very difficult to drive means that it's a very narrow in frequency space transition. Um, and, and that's a desirable property because it makes it very easy to realize an accurate representation of that transition. Um, so we're able to create a super, well, let's suppose we are able to create a superposition of two atomic states like this and create this evolving wave function, which is evolving at some rate and set by the laws of physics. Well, in order to actually get any information out of that, we're going to need some way of interacting with it. An atom, of course, that's light. So light is able to firstly create this superposition in the first place, uh, and secondly, to evolve in phase with the superposition as time passes, or possibly slightly not in phase, and that's your measurement. And you can read out to the end and see the phase difference between the light's evolution and the atom's evolution. It tells you that light really was the same. Or not. Um, so I'll, I'll show that a little schematically in a second, but first I'll go over a couple of ways that you can get an atom. It's all very well to say, I have an atom, but if you actually want an atom to be genuinely isolated from its environment, trapped in some way so that you can use it as a clock, then you need to make that happen. Um, so Experimentus really has two tools to do this. Um, this is a schematic of an optical lattice. So an optical lattice works by using very bright spots of light that interact with a neutral atom through its polarizability. So if an atom is in a polarizable state, then a very fast oscillating electric field can exert a net force. And so an atom that's in a substructure like this, where standing waves phrase between two mirrors, you get these very bright spots in the nodes, in the antinodes of the standing wave pattern. And these spots are trapped by this mirror, but it's kind of a pancake structure separated by the wave light and um, An alternative method is to use electric fields. That doesn't work for atoms, it's a neutral, but if you knock off one electron, you can have an ion, so you can use electric fields. Um, this is an ion. That's a little bit of an ion that we used to use. Um, this is a series of electrodes. You can use one zero, actually, you can send it around the ring here. So you apply a strong voltage here and zero volts here, and you create this kind of quadrupole shaped field like um, potential like this, um, and that's confining in one direction and anti-confining in the other, uh, and by flipping the sign of your voltages faster than the atom falls out, you can on average nudge it back to the middle. So whilst these don't create true harmonic potentials for atoms to be trapped in, they create pseudo harmonic potentials with time average. Um, I, I will show you this video as well. Um, this, this is just a nice video for this. Uh, this. This is an iron trap that's been turned off. This is one that's been turned on. So you can see how the ball kind of is nudged back into the middle, despite the fact that it's always been an trap. Alright. 
Um, okay, so we have an atom. I've convinced you, I hope, that the atom has some useful properties. It's got a transition that we'd like to measure. Um, so I've told you that we can get some light to do. We haven't really got where that light is coming from. But let's assume that we do have a source of stable light. Uh, what do we actually do with that light? Um, well, this, this is a philosopher. I, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the philosopher representation of the nuclear space. Um, if you're not, briefly, um, the, the north pole, the south pole there shows the atom in the ground state, the um, top pole there shows it in the other of the two states that we're considering, um, and the superpositions between those two states can be shown as a period. This equator phase accumulated between those two states through the rotation of the um, So the protocol of unusual atomic clock measurement is to start with atoms down here in the ground state. Apply a pulse of light that's going to create such a superposition as with this, the pointing here on the x axis, and then wait. Um, and this atom is spinning around this at its internal energy difference, but in the rotating frame, it's evolving away from where it started at a rate related to the difference between the internal energy of the atom and the energy of your laser. Uh, so your laser is not shining at the atom at this point, it's turned off or it's pointing somewhere else, but it is still going. Uh, and so later on, after some time has happened, after you go out of this phase to accumulate as long as you can, you turn your laser back on, and uh, now you can read out this phase, and that phase measurement tells you how much your laser disagrees with the atom, and then you can turn some dials and go out to the frequency of the laser back to the and it should be. And practically speaking, in terms of actually doing that, like I said, we just read out the phase, of course, we can't read the phase. Um, what we can read, though, is photons. Um, so we need a way to convert this phase into photons. So, so what we do is we apply a separate electric pulse that rotates this into, if you imagine this is on the equator of this circle here, if we apply a 90 degree rotation that would bring it onto a vertical equator in that direction, um, now we've converted phase into a population. So the actual measurement involves causing an atom that's in the ground state to emit a photon, and the atom that's in the excited state not to emit a photon, counting up those photons. And that tells you how, first of all, the population difference was, and therefore what the phase was. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this, but just to show you that there is detail, this, this is the uh, diagram of, it actually, actually is a slightly simplified diagram, and we're missing a magnifying structure. But, this is the strontium atom, and so this is to kind of show you all the different transitions that you have at your disposal when you want to do things like this. So, so it happens when you're making a clock with strontium, you use this particular transition here. We're doing phase evolution. That's useful because it's a very narrow transition. It's a very low nine width. And then you use this particular transition here for both cooling it down, like we talked about, and also reading out its state. And that's useful because it's very broad. All these other ones to play with to do other things. <coughs> um, okay, so that's the atom, and that's what we'd like to do to it. Um, but there is one missing ingredient, which is the light itself. So how does one go about getting very, very stable light such that you can use it to do measurements like this? Because you have to start with light that's already or order as stable as the atom itself. Um, if you've got light that's just completely wild and varying, then you're going to immediately accumulate higher phase. And now you've got no idea. Um, and so the trick to that is actually surprisingly simple. Um, we use a thing called an optical cavity. An optical cavity, again, it's two mirrors pointed to each other, uh, and the interference pattern formed by light reflecting from this mirror and then this mirror over and over again means that a cavity like this will create um, constructive interference if the wavelengths are an integer fraction of the length of the cavity and the constructive interference that they're not. Practically, you can turn on your light and it goes through the cavity if you've got the light matched to the cavity. Um, and so that's a tool to turn a very stable length into a very stable frequency. You can arrange it yourself to have a very stable length. You can now kind of solve the problem. Um, now, that's not a trivial problem, also, um, but it's a very technical problem. It's heat shields, vibration sensors, and things like that. It's 
problem that can be solved. Um, but just to let you know how well it has been solved, so for a 50 centimeter cavity, like the one at MPL, for example, for a 10 millihertz stability, 10 millihertz is the world record, as far as I know, for stability of light coming from a cavity like this. Um, that means that the average length between those mirrors, average over however long the I mentioned before, which is 1 to 10 seconds, varies by less than 35 atoms. So that's a tenth of the diameter of the proton. Or seen another way, if you took the light coming from this system and sent it to the moon, you bounced it back again, and you compared it with itself, it would be phase coherent, and then you could do that another 42 times before you might start to expect them to disagree. So this is the stability of light that you can get if you work really hard for it, and it's as clear as the light that you need to be able to really get the next level. And there's one final part before I move on to what we've done with the plots that you need to understand. We know how the plot works. We've got atoms, we've got light, we're able to use the atoms as a reference, and we're able to create stable light and steer it to match that reference. The final thing we need is a way to read the frequency of that moment. Uh, and that's obviously a hard thing to do. Light is hundreds of terabits. We don't ever have like, you know, electrical counters that can run at hundreds of terabits, so we can't just look at it and read it out. Even principle that's technically possible. Um, so we use a trick called a frequency cone. Uh, I think you've mentioned a few times yesterday. Um, frequency cones are fantastic things. They work by sending extremely short femtosecond or sometimes sub femtosecond pulses of light. Um, and if you think about what's going on here, um, this is the time domain picture of the electric field. Uh, you could describe this as a sine wave. Multiply, multiplied by a Gaussian envelope and then convoluted by the Dirac curve in the time domain. And if you think about what that does in the frequency domain, what you realize is that it's equivalent to this. It's equivalent to a, a whole load of teeth in frequency now, spread out and uh, separated by a very fixed amount of speed, the distance, one over the distance of time. Um, so this is a ruler, it's a frequency ruler that allows us to compare any point of frequency with linking, linking it all the way back down to a DC frequency that we can understand. Uh, so in practice, you send in a laser that you'd like to know the frequency of, it happens to be close to one of these teeth, and now rather than having to me measure a number like this, you're instead measuring the difference, which is something like this. this is a very achievable number that you can plug into the machine. Okay. Um, okay, I can see a frown, so I'll come back to that, but I'll, I'll move on. Uh, uh, just to give you a final view of all this put together, here, here's a kind of typical clock setup. You're actually seeing two atomic clocks here, which is a common feature of any clock experiment. You usually have two, because if you've got the most accurate clock in the bills, that's not much use unless you've got something similarly accurate to try and compare it against. Um, so here we're seeing uh, trapped iron in that iron trap I showed you earlier. Uh, light stabilized the cavities, some mechanism for changing the frequency of that light as this device here, and some mechanism for reading out the frequency of that light. That's it. So an atomic clock operator turns this thing on, adjusts the number here such that these lasers are both present with this atom, and then someone in this map over here counts up these frequencies and passes the clock out. How well does that work? Um, well, here's a plot of clock performance of a year. Um, this was the very beginning of atomic clock making. Um, and you can see the progress that's been going on. All of these blue spots here are microwave clocks. So this is cesium, and usually cesium, sometimes rubidium. Um, and they've been, as you can see, they usually progress. And these are the clocks that power GPS, these are the clocks that uh, but there is this new family of clocks coming in now that has actually overtaken the performance of season clocks, uh, and that is an optical clock. An optical clock uses optical transition frequency instead of microwave transition frequency, and there are various reasons why that's a good thing to do. Um, but I guess the point I'm trying to make 
is that the, actually this plot is out of date, it should now be going down to, to minus 19. Um, the uncertainties of the measurements that you can make with these plots are becoming pretty astonishing. Um, it's, I think it's common to say that if a you know, clock, if you took two clocks at 10 to the minus 18 and you crammed them together, you could run them for the lifetime of the universe before they would disappear by one second. So, so that's a nice kind of way of seeing it. It's not a very, actually I'm not personally very familiar with the lifetime of the universe, so for me a slightly more intuitive way of putting it is a clock at 10 to the minus 18 is able to detect the time dilation special relativity of moving at just half a meter per second. It's able to detect the gravitational dilation of the gravitational field of lifting up by just one centimeter. So these are scales that I'm familiar with, and the idea of time genuinely being slower a centimeter higher than here, and actually detecting that, I'm kind of quite interesting. Anyway. Um, moving on then to what you can actually do with the clock. And I'm going to begin with relativity, because um, it's fairly obvious that the clock could be used to test relativity, right? That was a key concept in the formation of relativity. I should also say I'm completely skipping over any use of clocks in technology. I'm skipping GPS, I'm skipping 5G, modern communications, things like that, where clocks have also been completely instrumental. But I'm focusing instead on what's use for physicists. Um, so, this is an experiment that was done in Japan. Uh, this was done by the Katori group. Uh, and this, this pretty much is exactly what I just described. This is taking two clocks and putting them at, uh, on the top and bottom of a tower, 450 meters apart, uh, looking at the, the, the change in the rate of the passage of time from those clocks. Um, and you can see here what data from one of these things works like. So this, this is how you would actually set the clock going. You would scan the frequency of the laser over this resonance. And this, this number here has something to do with the number of photons that are coming out of your atom in response to doing that sequence. Um, and you can see, just by looking, it's clearly shifted by a lot relative to the one on the ground. And that's the gravitational redshift. And um, these clocks were able to run for few weeks um, and resolve a gravitational redshift with this much extra, so I should find out for this here. Alpha here is a parameter which parameterizes the deviation from the predictions of general relativity. Um, if alpha equals zero, then time dilation for the general relativity is true. Uh, so for these measurements, measure alpha and this curve here. Now that is actually about twice as good as the measurement that was done in the 80s when they launched the clock into space on a rocket, but that clock was 10,000 kilometers away. Uh, these clocks are just 450 meters away. Uh, and there's a qualitative difference there as well, because these clocks are measuring smaller pieces of gravity closer to the Earth's surface, so perhaps that's a difference too. There is a technical use here as well. These clocks are now very good seismic sensors particularly in places like Japan, where there's a lot of tectonic activity, the ability to accurately see, basically quite deep into the Earth, and see what's going down, going on by looking at the way that the gravitational potential is affected. You could predict earthquakes and maybe one day save lives. Um, but if it's small, you're interested in. If you're looking for gravitational effects over small distances, we can do better than that. One of our speakers yesterday was talking about time dilation over um, one centimeter. Um, this, this is actually a measurement in a very recent measurement in um, um, Colorado, in, in uh, Jilla, by the Jilla group. Um, and in this experiment here, they created a lattice like the one I described. Um, and to give you a picture of what a lateral lattice looks like, it looks something like this. Um, so, so this is a fluorescence image of a cloud of atoms trapped in such a lattice. And it was orientated vertically. And the extent of that cloud is about a millimeter. Uh, by running a clock simultaneously over all those atoms, but then by treating each pixel on that camera image as a separate clock, calculating its signal for each pixel, you're actually able to detect a frequency gradient across this image from top to bottom. That's what we're plotting on the right here. Uh, 
Um, so that, that is the gravitational redshift across the cloud, a millimeter in scale. Uh, what you can do with that, I think my next speaker, I can tell you something like that, so I won't go to the case. But there's a fascinating thing to do, is to be able to resolve gravitational effects on the millimeters, to actually see them at the millimeter scale. Um, so I'll move on now from general relativity, special relativity, and into something a little bit different. Um, dark matter. So dark matter, as everybody knows, constitutes a large fraction of the universe. As currently, you don't know. No one knows what it is. Um, this this image, incidentally, is it's one of my favourite images of physics. This is a combination of two data sets. Uh, the heat map here is images from the Chandra Observatory, so these are X-ray images. Um, and it's images of two galaxies, known as the bullet cluster, that have collided with each other and are now in the state as having already collided. Uh, so you can think of the, the brightness of these images as the visible mass of these galaxies. This is where we predict that the visible mass, which behaves slightly fluid-like, charged plasma should be. So this collision has had the effect of causing this charged mass to interact with itself in the other galaxy. Um, but these three lines here are a reconstruction of where the gravitational mass must be. And that's been done by using the gravitational lensing of sources behind these galaxies. So this, to me at least, is one of the clearest pictures of this is where you can see the mass and this is where the mass very visual representation of dark matter that does exist. It's hard to give um, But despite knowing that it exists, we still don't know what it is. Um, a lot of e emphasis in dark matter researches has been in this region of parameter space here, weakly interacting with massive particles. Uh, and there's been good reasons for that. There are some theoretical theories which supersymmetry, for example, that would have put dark matter around here. Um, but um, as time goes on and as searches continue not to work, it's not to find anything, um, people started to think, well, actually, maybe there should be this and that assumption. What if dark matter was not actually here or even here? What if dark matter was light? Now, light dark matter has a few properties. Um, the, the first thing about dark, light dark matter you must immediately realize is that we know the density of dark matter. So particles of dark matter are light then the occupation number of them both must be really, really high. There must be a ton of them. Um, so that's, I guess, one of the main factors into the physics of high object like that. But I must say there is not much physics of high object like that. So it's very much, uh, it's, it's not a very well, I shouldn't say it's not a very well, but, but we don't have a lot of knowledge about how this happens. But what we can say is because, um, because the mode occupation numbers of these levels would be so high, um, a dark matter field, a dark matter scalar field, is likely to behave more like a classical field. Um, and its interactions with matter, if we suppose that they exist to some tiny minute level that we haven't yet seen, um, these would behave like a classical wave interacting with matter. So, so what would the effect of that be? on our physics. Um, if you imagine an energy level in an atom, an energy level is determined by all sorts of physics. There's lots of um, relativity going into it. There's lots of electromagnetism going into it, of course. We've got fundamental constants like the fine structure constant, like the mass ratio of the electron and the proton, and other things as well, all going into the calculation by physics of this number here. Um, well, one of the effects of an oscillating or a changing scalar dark matter field would be to effectively modulate the fine structure constant. Uh, and the, the modulation of the fine structure constant turns out to be proportional either to the square or the to, the, to, to the not square of the value of the scalar fields that's being excited. So the theory that goes that if such a field exists and if we're in it and if it changes over time, we might be able to see that by looking at the value of the fine structure constant. And a great way to look at the value of the fine structure constant is to use the atomic clock that's very 
very sensitive to changes in the fine structure. Um, so, so the work that we did next, um, we considered a particular form of dark matter events, a transient dark matter event. So this is the idea that self-interactions within the dark matter field might create self-organization or structures that are macroscopic in size of unknown size. Um, and if you saw such a structure, what you'd expect to see was, would be the Earth entering the structure, this coupling to the fine structure constant happening, and at some point you'd leave the structure again, and then the coupling go away. So you see a kind of step change. In, I'm, I'm saying the fine structure constant, other constants too, it's just that the fine structure constant is not where they can um, So to go about detecting that with a clock, you might have something like this. You might take two blocks, um, and at this point you have to think a little about how to actually do these measurements. So if I, if I take one clock, uh, and I see a bump like this, as a topological defect passes through the earth, you might say, well, great, I'll just measure that. Um, but the thing is, I don't actually have access to this number. This is the true frequency of the clock. But I'm only able to know the frequency of the clock by comparing it with another clock running out of the reference. So what I really need is two clocks, and they have to be different clocks, because otherwise they'll respond in the same way. So I need to find a clock made of one type of atom and another clock made of a different type of atom, type of atom that had a different response to changes in the fine structure content. Uh, and in doing so, I can create a universe number which I can actually observe, the frequency ratio between these two clocks, uh, and dunk, there is a readout of an event that happens in the fine structure um, glitches happen in the quite a lot, though, and if you have to be able to tell the difference then the constant changes. So, in practice, what you do is you don't use two plus, you use as many as you can get your hands on. So, that's what we did. Um, this, this is a fiber connection that runs between Germany, France, and uh, London. And uh, we were using, I think, it was six blocks altogether, two in each instance. I'm not going to dig into the details of the noise processes associated with it, but suffice to say that making a three kilometer, a three thousand kilometer loop <coughs> that's quieter than the clocks that you're trying to compare is, is quite a difficult thing to do. You have to set like both ways, you have to be careful about the symmetry of that, and you have to compare it and correct for any errors that you see. But it can be done. Um, and having done that, you can now run these clocks simultaneously and look at these events and run a simulation that bounds the size of any events that you didn't see. So we're excluding that the space here. Um, and this is what we end up. So um, these limits come from considering larger clock ranges. So this, this is um, box in satellites, um, phase shifts, for example, as a GPS satellite as a phase transition happens to move through the GPS range. There's a time where one clock is running at one rate, one clock is running at another rate. It's all the way through accumulated relative phase between the blocks of both ends of that network. Um, but this blue region is here, um, uh, and this was our work. This was our uh, defining of the parameter space of these transients. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that um, you don't have to assume transients, actually. One of the more common models for scalar dark matter is actually oscillations in the dark structure constants of the mass, that's sorry, the frequency characteristic. Itself. Um, and you can use ratios of clocks to do that kind of thing as well. Um, and here's a measurement like that. So, so this is this is actually just two clocks. This is a local measurement, um, and, and this is plotting the coupling strength of supposed fine structure, uh, supposed scalar dark matter, two clocks, uh, two fine structure clocks, even the mass of the dark matter particle. And so then, great space out there. Okay, um, a little bit longer. Um, so I'm going to move on to the final topic of my talk, which is um, using clocks to detect gravitational waves. Um, and th th this is what I worked on today, actually. Um, so to, to start with, how do we detect gravitational waves at all? Um, this is not a clock, this is LIGO. 
Um, LIGO detected gravitational waves in um, early 2000, I don't know what it was actually, but... 2016. 2016. Yeah, that was... 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 Yeah, that change in the length of space. Um, but light is a useful way to measure space because light always travels at the same speed as matter in space. Uh, and so LIGO here is using a ruler of light and sending it out, getting it to come back, and using the time taken for that light to travel to measure whether that time has changed because of the gravitational waves. But you can't do that with just one because there's lots of reasons why people might change, and most of them are gravitational waves, so you need a reference arm as well. Um, and so you can think of the second arm in LIGO, and actually they're both symmetric, they both contribute to the question as much as the other one does, but you can think of the second one as a reference. It's a way of sending light another way, so that if a gravitational wave comes through and affects this arm, but not this arm, then by the time the signals come back together, you can compare them and extract some information about the difference between what happened in those two arms without being sensitive. Um, so this, this here is the, the data of what they saw, actually this is the data from the paper. Um, and this was a black hole merger between black holes of about 30 stellar masses. Uh, it happens a billion light years away, um, and it's visible in the LIGO records for about 100 minutes or so. Um, so this, this was the first time that we've seen anything in the gravitational waves actually. Um, and it's an exciting point, right? Because all of a sudden we've got this new way of looking at the universe. It's, we've been looking at it with light for all this time, and that's taught us a lot. Maybe gravitational waves have just as much to teach, to teach us as light does. I think it's, it's a new way of seeing the universe. Um, and there's a lot of predicted gravitational wave sources out there, not just binary and spirals like this. Um, so obviously, the known ones that we've been seeing are gravity. Binary in spirals, but we have things like neutron stars that spin that would emit sperm continuous gravitational waves. One of the things that I find very interesting actually is stochastic backgrounds from Big Bang credits, for example. So this is the idea that um, whilst the, the early universe was opaque to light, uh, so any light that you see coming from the cosmic microwave background is, is coming from the light that was emitted after recombination of electrons. Protons. Uh, before that era, light just couldn't propagate because it was constantly interacting with the protons. So you can't really see anything that happened before um, before, before that time, before the amount of years after the start of the universe. And you can, of course, see elements of what was happening at that time, that's how we know, but um, you can't directly observe it. Gravitational waves don't have that limitation, and so in theory, if some kind of relic was that good, So there's some motivations for um, looking at gravitational waves. Um, I'm trying to talk through this already. So, so this is the mechanism by which LIGO causes a signal as this arm extends a little bit. We get a shift of one of these waves relative to the other. And it's a phase measurement. That's how we get it. Um, but here's an alternative approach using atoms instead. Um, so I've been talking about clocks. Um, and I, I propose that these are clocks, even though they might not look like them. Um, this is a cloud of atoms, and this is another cloud of atoms separated by some distance. Um, and the idea here is that a pulse of light that could travel from one cloud to the other, you can obviously vacuum, um, it takes a certain amount of time. Uh, and that amount of time is related to, to the distance between them, but also the speed of light. Now, if a gravitational wave were to come through, you might expect a modulation of this length, and therefore a modulation of this time. Um, and it's that time modulation that we would be able to 
measure by using atoms. So, so here what we're thinking, we're considering these atoms less as clocks, more as stopwatches, I suppose. They're, they're atomic stopwatches that start ticking when the light pulses go through them and then stop ticking when it goes through the other one here. So we're accumulating a phase on one clock at the top relative to the one at the bottom until the pulse goes through the top one and now they're both ticking at the same rate. And because they're atoms, because we know we can make really good clocks, we, we can trust that they'll continue to tick at the same rate as each other and stop communicating or accumulating relative phase. Um, so to go into a little bit more detail about how this works, this is actually a configuration known as an atom interferometer. Um, an atom interferometer takes, in concept, a single atom, or in practice you do it as many as you can, because you get as much signal as you possibly can that way. Um, you take a single atom and you spatially separate its wave function. So you can take a, a pulse of light that is tuned to create a superposition of an excited state and a ground state, um, and you use the fact that you've entangled the internal electric states of the atom, so it's excited and ground stateness, with its external degree of freedom. The photon that you must have absorbed to be in the excited state has momentum, so the atom now has more momentum. So this creates a momentum space to the position, and as time evolves, that becomes a position superposition as well. So we can spatially separate two parts of the wave function um, and have them travel different parts. Now, traditional interferometer works just like that, so you, you create a spatial separation, at some point in the middle, you, you flip the trajectories back over again, and you rejoin them to get together again here, and to this point, if you hope to see interference between those two parts, because if you don't, then you realize that I'll actually just send two classical clouds of atoms in two directions. But if you don't see that, you do see interference, proving you genuinely did have a spatial superposition here. Um, and this is data from the Kasevich group in Stanford University, showing exactly that. So this is the phase shift that you might add to one of these arms. Um, and this is what the readout looks like. So the readout here is atoms in physically separate places. So if I've got more atoms up here than I have down here, then I get a bright blob and I say that I have zero phase. Um, down here, well, I've got that so, so this, this literally is a picture of atoms separated by space. Um, as a brief aside into atom interferometry from the same group, Cassidy, um, this is a simulation of the world record of atoms being in same spatial superpositions. This is a 54 centimeter superposition of atoms. Um, and of course, you can't tell that unless you can bring them back together again afterwards and create interference between those wave packets and they did that too. Um, so, so, this was done in a 10 meter tower. And if you want to create a superposition of atoms, you need them to be not interacting with anything while you do that. So you launch your atoms on a parabolic trajectory up this tower. In a 10 meter tower, you can get three seconds of flight in total. And whilst they're flying, you're blasting them with photons. If you want to get this separation, you can't just do it once. You need to do it many, many times to split the wave packets as far apart as you can. And then when you get to the apogee, you change your mind, you start sticking them back together again, and you measure. And it looks something like this. So this is the neat image of zero or pi phase shift if you do a short interferometer. If you do a big one, well, obviously it doesn't work as well. You end up with lots of decoherence coming from closely from the pulses that you're using to do the separation. But I think we'll agree that that still clearly does show a very strong interference effect between these two of the wave packets separated by this much single atom. Um, so, that's a slight aside from what we're doing because um, we're really glossing over all the interesting stuff that that's been from this view. Uh, this is the phase that's accumulated in an atom interferometry sequence. It comes from a few places. It comes from um, lots of interesting places like the separation of the misalignment of the clouds when you get to build together. The really uninteresting place is the laser, but unfortunately that's the one that you have to worry about because it's quite hard to technically get rid of it. Um, the propagation phase, so this is the phase actually accumulated because of the separation in the atomic wave function, um, this has two properties to it. So it has the path integral of basically the Newtonian path that this atoms took, 
uh, many of the problems with that's the thing you're interested in is telling you something about the strength of gravity and the two parts. Um, but for the experiment we're doing, we actually don't mind so much about that. What we're really interested in is simply this, this normal evolution of the atomic phase because of the energy level. It's, it's simply this. It's just the uh, rate of accumulation space in a higher energy state. Um, and that's why I call these things stop watches, because they do all this stuff too, but, but this is the effect that we're really using in our sensitivity to gravitational waves. Um, Um, so, how then does that look if a wave does pass through? Uh, we have a single interferometer for now. Remember, we do have two interferometers, so I'll start with one. Um, if I create a wave function with separation like this, uh, in this region here, I'm accumulating positive phase in this arm relative to this arm, this rate. Uh, in this region here, it's the other way around. And uh, because the rate at which I'm accumulating phase is just set by the energy difference between these two levels because I'm very careful to keep my atoms isolated so that I'm not those constants. Um, I could just pull that out and give them a sensitivity function with um, uh, size of the one state. So I'll just pull out the rate of change to the front of this function here. And I'll just say that the number that I'm going to observe for the total phase accumulated over sequence like this is going to be the integral of this function here. And as I draw in the integral of this function, it's zero, um, which is what you would expect because I haven't supposed to make gravitational waves at this point. Um, so that's one interferometer. What about two? Um, two interferometers look a bit like this. Um, so I've got one at the bottom here, uh, one at the top here. And just to be clear on the physical picture, we've got two separated clouds of atoms, each one of which is doing its bit like that. So this atom is a spatial superposition here, and this one is a spatial superposition here, but there's no correlations between these two atoms, which is classically separated. Um, so here's, here's what I showed you for one interferometer. Um, the second one looks just the same as the first one, except that it's been delayed by the amount of time that it took the photon to fly. So we end up with the same sensitivity function, just shifted slightly in time. Um, so the question now is then, what is the differential sensitivity function that we're going to measure? Um, the one to operate with differential configuration. The reason for that, you could say, um, is because that laser phase noise I was talking to you about, we like to ignore, we don't get to ignore it unless we do something to, to make it cancel out. So by, by using literally the same light, to do these pulses both on the top and the bottom of the cloud, to ensure that the laser phase printed on each pulse in the sequence is common to both of the interferometers, and that it justifies us crossing it out in that equation. But having, with that caveat out of the way, we, we've now, we're now forced and get to consider this differential measurement here. Now, the integral of that function is still zero, um, but it looks a little bit different. Um, but now what if a gravitational wave comes through instead? So as a gravitational wave passes through this experiment, um, you would imagine that um, the, the length of the experiment is going to change. Uh, the time that it took for the photon to fly at the beginning is going to be different from the time that it takes the photon to fly in the middle when the gravitational wave has stretched the space and it's going to be different again from the end when the gravitational wave has contracted. Uh, and that has the effect of changing the sizes of these sensitivity functions. If you look at what that does to their difference, I think you can see that this no longer integrates to zero. And um, this, the integral of this is some number that tells you something about the strength and I guess the frequency of the gravitational wave that pass through this cloud. Uh, and it's this that really sits at the heart of the sensitivity that we are making these things. So, so what do you want for a good gravitational wave? Well, for a good gravitational wave detector, well, you want this length to be as big as you can. The bigger this length is, the, the bigger this effective change is going to be. Um, you'd like this sensitivity function to be as tall as possible. You'd like the accumulating phase as quickly as possible. Um, and so I'll start with one here. 
uh, it wouldn't be one, we would usually be doing the same kind of tricks as the Cassavich group do, which is uh, applying multiple momentum splits, creating large wave function separations, so that we're accumulating the data many times. The, uh, uh, um, and finally, I've talked a bit about a gravitational wave detector here. Um, but I'm just going to briefly tie back to what I was talking about earlier about dark matter because, um, as it happens to be, the sensitivity works exactly the same way. These really aren't flying clocks, uh, so you really can do similar kind of things with them as you can do with the clocks. So uh, if we think instead of um, an oscillation that defines structure constant instead of a gravitational wave, we're supposing now that our length, this, our length is now constant, uh, but what's changing actually is the tick rate of the stopwatches. So that causes the same kind of effect. Where we have that suddenly non-zero interval here, and uh, sensitivity to oscillations in the energy gap between those internal energy states. Um, so how well could that work? Um, this is a plot of um, black hole mergers here. Um, black hole mergers aren't the only thing that you can see that's a to look at. Um, here are some simulated signal strengths for various black holes. So this, this is a measurement of this is the characteristic strain of this signal here on Earth. Uh, there's any kind of detect that we have to be able to see. Um, and these three sets of three lines are for black hole measure pairs in different sizes. So this one down here of 60 solar masses, that's kind of like the one that LIGO saw. Um, heavier and heavier ones show up with larger strains, but small frequencies. Um, and in case you don't like working in redshift, by the way, I've put a map here of redshift to the age of the universe. Uh, so uh, this redshift of five, for example, is actually telling you that this was when the universe was one billion years old and therefore young. Um, so, where does LIGO sit on this, for example? Well, LIGO sits here, um, and actually that black hole that I showed you at the very beginning sits here. Um, so that's pretty much exactly what you expect from LIGO according to this graph. So that we, we saw that measurement at the beginning, but we've seen the graphs probably per seconds, um, and, and that's more or less what these numbers are saying. So as I mentioned, these dots are representing how long this black hole pair then spends in that part of the spectrum. So a black hole pair of 60 solar masses will spend 10 years oscillating at a few millihertz and producing gravitational waves of this size. It'll then spend, it'll get spiraling, lose its energy, and eventually it'll be faster. It'll only spend an hour there at this rate, and eventually it'll collide. So, so LIGO was picking up the end spiral of the black hole there. So this is a black hole that was previously out here, and over the course of 10 years, moved up to here, and it crashed into itself, uh, and that's the end of the spiral. Um, so, so here are some other detectors. Um, these, these two, the Einstein telescope and LISA, these are both alternative light-based technologies which have been proposed, um, and may well be constructed soon. Um, but there is still a gap in the middle here, uh, and it's this gap that Aeon targets. Um, so so this, um, this plot here shows you the sensitivity of a 100 meter detector. It hasn't made much progress into this gap, but it has made some. Um, but the, the ultimate goal of our project is to build a much larger scale detector than that. So we're planning one day on reaching kilometer scale detector. Um, this would be a vertical tube of one kilometer in length of atom interferometers, probably not just at the top and bottom, probably straight throughout for various reasons. Um, and if you can get good results from that, you might even imagine a space-based detector as well. Um, so this is a space project, a space proposal called EDGE, um, which takes this technology and puts it on two satellites, uh, a laser linking the two together in the atoms, uh, and the, the huge baseline that you can have to get from that. And another benefit of satellites is because you're in free fall already, you don't have to throw your atoms and you're not limited by the height that you can throw them to. Just put them there, get them out as much as you want, bring them back together again. Um, 
So the takeaway from this is that if the LIGO black hole had occurred whilst an Aeon like detector were running, instead of seeing it in the last 100 milliseconds, we would have been able to see it hours, days, months, years ahead of its merging. So this would have given us time to look at it, to study it, uh, and to swing our detectors around to view it when the final merge happens in the gamma ray bursts optical signals and just generally learning more about the universe. So uh, I'll leave you there with a quotation from Plautus. Uh, and um, I'll say thank you very much for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions.
this. Um, I have a, I don't know, potentially facetious question. So, uh, when you talked about um, looking for modifications to the prime structure constant, you made this comment about uh, the necessity of comparing two frequencies to make uh, a change in just one, you won't be able to, um, well, it's not meaningful in a sense, it's not terrible. Um, I mean, implicit in, in, in talking about the accuracy of the clock is the idea that there's some sort of better clock somewhere that you can kind of compare it to, right? If you, if you want to say, this clock is, if I say that I have some clock in the lab and, and, and it's off by this piece of seconds, off by these music with respect to some potential other clock that's what I'm comparing with. No? Usually you would be comparing it with itself. So you would suppose an identical duplicate of itself. And then you're, you're making no claim about which one is right. You're just saying that these two experimental apparatuses, when set up like this, so that's their styles will be like this. So that's stability, right? That's the, the, the variance in the outcomes, right? And there's accuracy, which is just how close to us to the true value. Uh, so the experimentalists would avoid that problem. So <laughs> accuracy just means you did it with a cesium clock instead of with uh, instead of with a turbine or a clock. But then there exists no fractional accuracy greater than the minus 16. Um, there's no clock that's ever been able to measure that because they can't, because that cesium is not that good. So these numbers are 10 to minus 18. I'm saying if I take two clocks of this type and compare them to each other, I divide their frequencies together and I get this that unitless ratio. And because it's unitless, I'm not limited by the accuracy of what I call a second. If you don't mean that one is going to me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we better move on so we don't take up too much of the next week's time. So let's thank Charles again.